Hey guys, welcome back to Reasonably Certain. My name is Ellen. This is episode 17, and we're gonna talk about how I'm almost 30 and I've never had a boyfriend. Yeah, um, it is true. And I'm not gonna say unfortunately true because that is kind of the point of today's episode. Um, But it is kind of a phenomenon. Like, it is kind of rare. Maybe less rare nowadays, obviously, than, than it would have been even 10 years ago, but still kind of rare to have literally never had a boyfriend and almost be 30 years old. I mean, basically, I'm a 30-year-old virgin at this point. <laughs> Not literally, but like, basically, basically. So anyway, um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. That's the episode topic. Um, lots of juicy, juicy stuff to talk about. One of my favorite topics to talk about, um, if you know me in real life, if you're around me, it's something that comes up in conversation quite a lot. Um, but before we get into that, what I've been up to this week, I met a new friend. We went out to coffee together. Actually, we both got chai lattes because although I love the taste of coffee, coffee does not really like love me back. So although I would love to get coffee, it just doesn't work with me. So tea is usually my best friend in the case when I need, uh, some caffeine, So chai lattes are always my go-to if I'm going to go out for quote-unquote coffee. And then I got a um, like a lemon poppy seed cake, which was really freaking good. And it had like a little raspberry glaze like frosting on top, like, but like a glaze, not like a frosting. You know what I mean? Super freaking delicious. Um, So that was fun. I haven't met a new friend in a while. Well, I guess I say a while, but Yeah, I haven't met as many new friends recently as I did like last year, for example. Um, I think that's just the nature of like living in a city, though. You, you know, over time, friend groups change and shift and whatever. And yeah, Uh, I went to Moco Museum on Thursday for a walk for World Mental Health Day. And my friend Fernanda runs City Girls Barcelona. So she set up this collaboration with Moco Museum. We did a walk and we got to see the museum before it opened and we walked through Park Ciutadella and then we ended with a breakfast at Eat Nudes Cafe and I got a Blue Moon smoothie and it was really good. It tasted like green apples with like a hint of lime, super good. Um, And then I went to dinner that night with my friend Tali and her friend that's visiting from the UK. We went to this like tapas restaurant that I've been walking by a lot and I was meaning to try it and it ended up being really good. I, like I've talked about before, I'm very particular about my patatas bravas. And this restaurant had amazing patatas bravas, like super delicious. Like I've had such a range, like the thing is, that I find a bit confusing and frustrating is whenever you go to a restaurant, since Patatas Bravas is such a staple here, you can expect to find them on the menu at basically every single restaurant here, unless it's like a specialty, like not Spanish food. But honestly, at most restaurants, you'll be able to find it on the menu. However, they all make them differently. Like their definition of Patatas Bravas is extremely inconsistent. So, I say the first time I had patatas bravas, I'm going to be saying that way too much. But the first time I had them was at Cala Treumal. So it was like a little like beach shack restaurant up in Costa Brava. And this was like last June. And I was like, oh yeah, I've been meaning to try those. Like, let me try them. And they were fantastic. Like super crispy, fresh off the fryer, had sauce on them, but like the sauce wasn't too spicy. It wasn't like too much of anything. It was just like a perfect complement to the potatoes. And they were like perfectly crispy without being too like dry. It was amazing. So of course, my first impression being like the best ones that I've ever had, I was like, oh, this is what patatas bravas are? Like, hell yeah, I'm gonna get these at every restaurant that I can get them at, because I love potatoes. So then I went on this like journey over the past year of just like, I, and honestly, usually they're, they tend to typically be gluten-free, hopefully at most restaurants. So it's, it's, of course, depends on the restaurant, but they're a pretty like, reliable menu item for me because at a lot of like tapas restaurants it's like all they serve is like bread meat and cheese and I don't usually want a plate of just meat and cheese so my other safe bet that I can usually go for is patatas bravas or a tortilla and if I'm picking between the two I prefer just the potatoes 
Um, so I've been on this journey of trying them like pretty often from almost every restaurant I've gone to just, just to find another good place because I can't keep going an hour and a half away to Costa Brava just to get freaking potatoes. So I have not really found any other places here that have what I would consider really good patatas bravas, but this place I went to on Thursday did them really well. And I think there's one other place I've been to, maybe it was Elsa y Fred. I think it was, no, I could be wrong. God dang it, I can't remember. But there's only two places I've been to, and one of them was this place I went to on Thursday that does them like, oh crap, how do you call it? Like filleted? Filet potatoes fried in a cube? <laughs> oh, how do you call it? Dang it. I'll, yeah, like fried potato stacks. Like you've probably seen them on TikTok. It's like, not specific to patatas bravas. It's like just a way of making potatoes extra crispy. So they make the potatoes in like a cube. And then on each side, you cut like a third of the way into the cube so that there's like more surface area to get crunchy. So then on each side of the cube, it's cut like a third of the way in so that it doesn't completely fall apart when it's cooked but like the middle stays whole, but then there's like way more surface area around the whole cube. So that's how they did them. Like all of them were these like super crunchy, super crispy cubes, but then it still had like some soft potato in the middle. Oh my God, it was so freaking delicious. Holy crap. Oh, I love potatoes when they are done perfectly well. Like crispy smashed potatoes, those bravas that I had on Thursday where it's like the extra surface area is all crispy. What I hate is when I go to a restaurant that says they serve patatas bravas. And since potatoes, to be fair, take a bit longer to cook to really get them like crispy on the outside, I think they just throw them in the pan and like hope for the best. And you just basically get soggy potatoes where I'm like, this would be better if you could at least give me like something to mash them with. And I'll just make mashed potatoes out of them. Like they're, these are what I would consider pre-mashed potatoes. You know what I mean? Like they're kind of soft. They're not crispy at all. The skins are like falling off. It's basically just boiled potatoes. And I'm like, ooh, that is not patatas bravas, okay? <laughs> so anyways, I was very, very thrilled to find them and to have them be so delicious and so crispy. Although I do get a little annoyed. I know for presentation's sake, it does look kind of nice to have like the red and the white sauce like spread or like put on the top. It makes it look better for a photo, but I don't like the sauce being put on for me because I like to choose how much sauce I put on. And by the time it gets to the table, it's already starting to make the potatoes soggy. So I like to dip as I'm eating so that I get like maximum crunchiness but that's just me. I also wanted to, I haven't done this yet because I just didn't have time this weekend, but my plan during this week, this past week, I listened to the episode, oh gosh, you know what? Let me just find it. So this week I also listened to episode number 164 from Note to Self by Peyton Sarton. Hi Peyton, I love you. I love following her and I love her podcast, Note to Self. So if you are kind of, I mean, I feel like we have sort of similar vibes, but I think you guys would really enjoy it. So if you haven't heard of Peyton or haven't listened to her podcast, I highly recommend it. I listened to her podcast episode called Enter Your New Era, How to Reinvent Yourself. And I love a good reinvention, self rebrand. So that's kind of what she was talking about because she did a little like podcast rebrand. And I love how she always talks about like taking yourself on a date. Like don't be afraid to just like treat yourself to stuff and like spend time by yourself and like really get to know yourself. And so I was planning on doing that this weekend, but I just didn't have time. So I'll be doing that this week, but that's what I listened to. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Like I love just finding new ways to learn about yourself. And so I loved her suggestion of saying like, get a new journal, get in, like maybe even get a new pen, go to a cocktail bar, order yourself like whatever your favorite drink is and just sit there. Maybe like even with headphones in and put your favorite podcast or favorite music on or whatever. And like, just take yourself on a date night and like, just think to yourself, like what would my ideal version of myself be? So she had some few example questions to ask, but like you can look up any sort of journal prompts online. Like you can really customize it to make it your own. And of course, if you don't drink or you don't want to go out at night, like you could turn it into like 
a coffee break in the morning or like you could even go on a hike in the woods and like sit on a rock you know what i mean like make it your own but the idea is to like be with yourself and just do things that you enjoy think about what you enjoy think about the person you want to be and i love any excuse to do that because it's just fun to learn about yourself so i really enjoyed that i'm planning on doing that this week and then last thing, I went out to dinner last night again with my friend Tali and her friend from the UK. And then um, a few of their other friends joined us and we went to a Japanese buffet, which was really good. I don't remember the last time I did that. Probably at Akita in Woodbury, Minnesota, like 10 years ago. <laughs> like it's been a while. So that was really nice. The food was really good. Uh, and then we went out to a bar slash lounge afterwards and it was technically a hookah bar and I was like, okay, I'll see if I can vibe with this. I haven't, you know, smoked hookah for probably 10 years <laughs> and I did not like it. The, first, the one and only time I tried it, it made me like sick. So I just never did it again. And I was like, okay, I just know that like secondhand smoke, whether it's from a hookah, a cigarette, a cigar, weed, like whatever it is, for some reason, I genuinely, I don't know what it is, makes me feel like there's like pins and needles in my stomach. Like it just feels like the most achy cramps ever. And I, I really don't know why. It's like me just breathing in the smoke like makes my insides feel really like pinchy and crampy and I don't like it. So thankfully I didn't get that feeling last night cause we weren't also like none of us were directly smoking hookah. So thankfully in the lounge, like I, I think only one table was. So it wasn't like, you know, super intense with smoke and stuff like that. But I really liked the lounge vibe. I was like, okay, now if I'm going to go out, I would rather go to a lounge that's like not too packed with people. You can sit down. It's like got good music, good vibes. You can get really good cocktails for like still a decent price. And you're not like standing at the bar in a crowd, like trying to get the bartender's attention. Like they still come and serve it to you. And I was like, yeah. I prefer this vibe much more. Like I'm going to be on the outlook for lounges, I guess. I, I don't know like what you would call them. The only thing is I think a lot of them are probably combined with hookah and I don't really love being around smoke. So TBD, I'll tell you guys if I discover anything, <laughs> but the one we went to last night was pretty, pretty cool. Like not super busy though. So if you were in a small group or like just two people, maybe could be a bit boring um but would be a good date night spot i think if you were on a date like because it's not too crowded not too loud like you can still hear each other talk and get like a good really good cocktail so yeah that was my weekend anyway so let's get into the topic that i know everybody is dying to hear about um how i've made it to almost being 30 and i've just somehow never had a boyfriend <laughs> like I don't know. It's so hard. I just have to like constantly kick them all away from me. Like get away, you guys. There's so many lining up at the door. It's just like, oh, it's so hard to stay single. Like, oh my God. But I somehow manage it, you guys. Like I've made it this far. It's it's quite an impressive feat if I have to say so myself. But anyways, what kind of sparked this idea in my head was mainly the show Nobody Wants This on Netflix. Ah! <laughs> oh my God. If you have not seen, if you have not, <laughs> I can't even get through it. It's so good. If you have not seen Nobody Wants This on Netflix, I urge you, urge you. It's urgent. This is extremely urgent to go watch it. Please, please, if you watch one thing on any streaming service this year, it has to be Nobody Wants This on Netflix. I'm hyping it up a lot, but please trust me when I say I don't think I've ever seen a show or a movie that made me like kick my feet and giggle the whole time when I was watching it. Like, ooh, oh my God, like, is this like real? So yeah, and I think it's just the Adam Brody effect. Like he has an it factor. He has an it factor. Like, yeah. So, so that's a very big reason for why I had this episode topic in my mind outside of the fact that it's already just something that's on my mind pretty much 24 seven, but to dedicate like a full episode to it with nobody wants this as kind of like the catalyst. It's like, 
chef's kiss perfect so also i've been watching love is blind us season seven we are on you know what before i say too much as of filming this it's sunday october 13th we are officially on episode nine of love is blind season seven us um episodes 10 and 11 why are they stringing it out so much episodes 10 and 11 come out this wednesday and then episode 12 the finale comes out on october 23rd and then the reunion comes out on october 31st so halloween <sighs> they really love to string it out don't they anyway so that's kind of part of it as well because honestly it's getting real interesting if i could say that <laughs> Um, so that's kind of like a side, you know, inspiration, but mostly it's because of nobody wants this. So I think before I jump into my personal thoughts and opinions and feelings and experience, I need to tell you about nobody wants this. And I don't want to spoil it for you, please. If you've already watched it, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more. Maybe I'll talk about it a bit first. And then I don't know if there's, you know what, let me just start talking and if you don't want to hear anything about Nobody Wants This because you want to like enjoy it and then come back and listen to this, there will be chapters so you can skip ahead. And by the way, if you haven't noticed like chapters, I don't know if they're available in Apple Podcasts, but they should be available in Spotify and on YouTube. So for anyone that doesn't know, I put them in every single episode just so you can get a vibe of like, you know, where what things I'm talking about at what point in time. Uh, anyway, so Nobody Wants This starring Kristen Bell and Adam Brody. I did not watch the OC, but everybody was freaking out because Adam Brody was in the OC and he had the same level of riz in the OC, I guess, as he does in Nobody Wants This. And in all the interviews I saw, Kristen Bell was like, if we do this, you know, show, like Adam Brody has to be Noah. Like he has to play Noah. He has to play the main character like it just has to be Adam Brody like he is the guy he's the guy like from Spy Kids 3D like you're the guy he's the guy she's the guy Adam Brody is the guy so she knew that he had to play Noah and by the way the nobody wants this story is based on a real real story because the director oh boy let me look this up the director or sorry program creator Aaron Foster it's like based on her personal life story. I don't know how closely it's based on her life story, but apparently like in her real life, she married a guy who was a rabbi or was becoming a rabbi. So like this follows very closely to like her real life experience. So yeah, we also have Justine Loop who plays Morgan, which is in the show Kristen Bell's sister. And then Timothy Simon Simons who plays Sasha, who is Noah's brother. So like the sibling dynamic is super funny. I love like the comedy that's between all of them and like how the characters interact. Um, but I mean, the cherry on top is Adam Brody. Like the show would not be the same without him. Like, oh, it just makes me want to scream and giggle and kick my feet. Like, it's so good. Like, from episode one, like, the first scene that he's in, he's already, like, Riz on 10. Like, I know this is, like, kindergartner vocabulary nowadays, but, like, he is the Rizzler. Like, <laughs> I never thought I would hear myself say that in a sentence and like be serious, but I'm not even joking. Like you think of like who has level a million charisma, like it's Adam Brody. Like I just, I dream of speaking with a guy that is hot and has that much charisma. Like what is off the fucking charts? It's off the charts. I I get why some, it, it was like an instant sensation because every probably woman I'm guessing who is watching the show is like, oh my God, this is it. Like, this is what most women are looking for. That's why it's such a sensation and why everyone is so obsessed with it because like, hello, hello. <sighs> so Kristen Bell has a podcast with her sister. It's like call her daddy-esque. She meets Noah, who is a rabbi, but she doesn't know it at the time at a dinner party for her friend slash manager and 
she didn't think he was a rabbi at the time because he doesn't look like stereotypically what you would, I don't know, I guess a rabbi looks like. So then when he starts speaking as the rabbi, she's like, what? You're a rabbi? And then she's like, oh, I'm intrigued. And then he walks her out to her car with like, again, level a million charisma. And they're just already like tension and playfulness and flirtiness is like off the charts from episode one. And it just gets better from there. So I already can't wait for season two. Um, if those, if those of you have seen it, you get it, you get it. Like it's so good. So yeah, that made me think like after I watched it, I was like, you know what? I am actually so thankful that I have not had a boyfriend because I need to know these things. Like I need to see these good examples of like a healthy attachment and like healthy relationship and like a funny, good, charming guy and like be like no like that is my standard and like unless i can find that like i'm good i can be single like i can do everything myself like i'm perfectly content in my own life the way it is now being single like i don't need to force something that's not like what i want and basically watching nobody wants this i was like silly me how could i forget obviously that is the standard like and even a lot of things that he's doing, we could say is the bare minimum. But like, you know, the bar is in hell. So like, you know, most guys I would say are like really not even coming even a hair close to like what Adam Brody is showing in the show. And it's not even just his charisma. Like, obviously, that's the part that I was like, so like kicking my feet and giggling at. But specifically the episode where Joanne Kristen Bell gets the ick and it is like the most perfect portrayal of somebody getting the ick. Like, I think that needs to go down in cinematography, like history of like the first accurate portrayal of the ick, <laughs> like, like the thought process and like the weird light switch that goes on. That's that you're like, oh my God, like, why didn't I see this before? But then like you think, and I love the show so much because there's all these like points where you think, oh, it's gonna just go to shit and they're gonna like fight and it's gonna be bad and like it's gonna be toxic and they're gonna wanna like get away from each other and like it's gonna, it's not gonna work because we never get to see a love story that is truly like healthy and secure and loving and like funny and just enjoyable. Cause like you never get to see that. It's always something that's like toxic or they break up and get back together or they fight a lot. Like it's never truly like, wow, oh my God, that is like a healthy example of a relationship. So when she gets the ick and she's acting all weird about it and he can tell obviously that she's clearly, she's gotten the ick, he comes out into the backyard and he's like, okay, something obviously was off in there. Like what's going on? Like, let's talk about it. Let's not try and like make this weird. Like, obviously I gave you the ick today. Like what's going on? And so they get over the ick. Like it's a beautiful way of him being like, hey, I get it. Today, maybe not one of my best moments, but you love me and you're not gonna get scared and run away. And, and it wasn't like a creepy way of him being like, no, you love me. Like it was like, it's confronting a lot of like, for Joanne, she's a very like fearful avoidant, which I relate with very heavily. So for her to be like, no, 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 like I think, yeah, this is usually when it gets bad. Like this is probably the sign that it's like done. And he's like, stop running away from something that's good. Like this is a very superficial thing to get icked out about. Like stop letting this ruin something that can be really good. And it's so nice to see a guy that has like a healthier attachment style than the girl. Cause she's not like super unhealthy, but she has fearful avoidant attachment style. So like she's constantly looking for things that are gonna like be like, oh yep, this is it. Like it's not gonna work or like, you know, we can't, we can't make this work. And he's like, slow down. Like nothing is set in stone. Like we can figure this out. And it's like, oh my God, are guys out there that are really like that? Oh my God. The bar is in hell guys, the bar is in hell. <laughs> But I'm not kidding you. Like, I'm already re-watching the show. I'm, like, ha almost already done re-watching it. Because I just, like, needed to remind myself. Because it's already been a couple weeks since I watched it, right? And I just needed to remind myself of all of the good parts that I really, really enjoy from the show. 
And yeah, it's just like, I want to have a good example of what I want in my mind so that I don't waver because there's so much pressure, especially on women to date or get married or like, just hurry up and pick someone. Like, why do you have to be single? Like, don't you feel sad and like lonely? No, like I'm great. I I know it sounds like I'm doing great. I love being single. I'm great though. Like, of course, would it be nice? Of course, of course. I'm not saying it wouldn't be nice. Of course it would be nice. But like, am I fine on my own? Yes. And I I don't feel the need to change that unless someone's like really going to knock my socks off. You know what I mean? So I just haven't been, I, I will, I know myself very well. I know what I want. I know what I don't want. Trust me. I live alone and I am a freaky type A organized planner. Like, I've made lists, okay? Pros and cons, wants and don't wants, deal breakers, like ideal and not ideal. I think I've probably made 30 of those lists in the last 10 years. Like I know what I like and what I don't like. And so it does honestly frustrate me a bit when my friends are like, oh, like, how you're so picky, you're so picky. I'm like, that's like a threat. Like, why are you guys trying to like bring me down from what I want? Like, that's crazy. Like, it honestly does frustrate me a bit because I'm like, why are y'all trying to convince me to go out with like some random dude? I don't want that random dude. If I wanted him, I know myself. As soon as I think a guy is like remotely attractive, I'm like, oh my God, he's so cute. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I know myself. It's like a very clear, like yes or no. I'm not like in the middle on guys. Like if I'm in the middle and it's not a hell yes, it's like a hell no. So I know myself unless I'm like really excited and giddy over a guy, it's like a straight up no. Like I'm just not going to try because there's no benefit. You know what I mean? So like I've tried the dating apps. I've tried whatever. I guess we can kind of move away from nobody wants this now. My point of bringing that up though is just, it's such a good show. So first of all, watch it. And second of all, it gives me a good example of like, okay, I have, can. I, will, I know it's a show guys. I know it's a show, but I think that that is a very nice example of like what we could see in a relationship in real life. I don't think it's, I don't think it's unrealistic at all. And I think if I'm going to be dating somebody, I want them to at least be as charismatic and caring and funny and healthy, have a healthy attachment style like uh, Noah does in the show. I don't think that's too much to ask. And if you think it's too much to ask, then sorry, we're just on totally two different pages. But I have gone on the dating apps and I show my friends all the time like it's honestly a topic of conversation too often it needs to be less but a lot of my friends that are in relationships even will be curious and I'll be like yeah like look look at my hinge it's terrible like you're gonna literally laugh like it's so bad and I've been living here in Barcelona specifically because I wasn't really on the apps for like most of COVID I kind of gave up But I was like, okay, I'm going to like dip my toes back into the water and the dating scene a little bit now that I'm in Barcelona and like see how it goes. And I've only ever used Bumble and Hinge in the last like 10 years, probably like I've never really been into Tinder. So those are the only two apps I've been using. I deleted Bumble like a few months ago and then I re-downloaded Hinge just because like the curiosity kills me. And at least you can see likes that come in on like on Bumble. You can't see them unless you pay and like I'm not paying. So anyway, I've also applied to Raya. So I mean, hey, I won't be mad if I get accepted just because like the FOMO is killing me. But right now I keep Hinge only just as like, I don't know if I'm dying of curiosity, I'll go look on there. But it's terrible because every time I open the app, I'm like disappointed. So it's like it makes me very cynical because I open it disappointed, open it disappointed, open it disappointed. So it's like I'm never getting like a hit of hope. It's always going like trending downwards. So I'm like the it's like a terrible cycle because you get like a pinch of hope or like a you get like a hint of hope and you're like okay let me just open it like just in case like what if what if and every time you're like oh hinge thinks i'm most compatible (laughs) oh or you see the likes that come in and you're like oh oh okay um so yeah i i'm never impressed and like i'll literally look through the app i'll be I'll be like swiping and just clicking X, 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 X. Cause I only need to see someone's profile for about 0.3 seconds. If I know, I'll know immediately if I'm into them or not. And my friends are like, you're going so fast. Like, stop, take a look at their profile. I'm like, I don't need to look at the first photo. You think that's going to intrigue me to swipe down more? Like, unless I see the photo and I'm like, whoa, 
I'm not swiping down to see the rest. Like almost every single first photo is, hey guys, no offense, terrible. It's so bad. And I'll get into this later in the episode, I think, but like side note, almost every single man on the planet could be so much hotter, so much hotter if they just put like 5% more effort into like their profile and, and how they dress and do their hair. Like you don't have to get surgeries like women are always pressured to do. You don't have to like wear a ton of makeup. You don't have to do that much. Like just maybe revise your wardrobe like a teeny bit. You don't have to completely change your style, but like basketball shorts and like a sweatshirt, you know, aren't like always the most flattering. And like maybe go get a fresh lineup and I don't know, whiten your teeth or something. Like, it's just, it's not that hard. Like, do you know how much women pay to like look good monthly? It's wild. So like guys could just take like a hint of that shame and guilt and like they could go miles with it. You know what I mean? Like it wouldn't even take that much effort. So like, or like maybe they could go to like an improv class and like learn some comedy, like some like witty you know, banter, like that would be cool too. Like, honestly, it is hard on the apps because I am making a very harsh judgment on the first photo, but you have to, like, I'm not gonna sit there. If you don't like, this is how it goes with resumes and applying for jobs too. Like, if you don't catch my attention on the first photo, like I'm not sitting there and reading through your whole profile, which you probably didn't even fill in. So I probably don't even know enough information about you to even know if I should s send you a like anyway. Ah. Oh. It makes me so annoyed. But anyways, I'm just very glad that I have this good example of Noah to be like, to remind me like, yeah, I'm not sacrificing like my peace and happiness unless it's for a guy that I think is like super charming, super funny, super caring, has a really healthy attachment style and is like very respectful and thoughtful. Like that is the bare minimum for me. Sorry. So I do honestly get frustrated when my friends like see guys on the apps and stuff and they're like, give him a chance. I'm like, S maybe for you, like, do you want the app? Like here, take it. Like you go look. I don't, I'm not interested. I look all the time for the last year and a half, especially. And I'm like, hey, if that's what's out there, like I'm good. I'm so good. I'm so good actually. Like I'll just like be celibate forever. Like I'm so good. So I just like don't like feeling pressured just for the sake of like just trying it. I do think though I could potentially, like I should for some like exposure therapy, try to go on a date or two like once in a while just to break the ice and like remove the boundary there for me a little bit just to, so that I'm not so worried about it. But I've even, I've had that on my mind. Like, okay, I literally have like Q4 goal 2024, go on one date. I, I can't even bring myself to do one date because like, I just can't even find a guy that I, I like even like this much. That I'm like, oh, I mean, maybe we won't be like soulmates, but I could try a date with him. I, guys, <laughs> oh, I can't even find a guy to do one date. Like just, just as, just as, even if it was just more friendly and not, not so romantic, like I can't, <sighs> I can't even find one, not even one bro, not even one. Oh, so it, it is really desolate. It is really terrible out there. Even the Rose section where like Hinge is supposed to keep all of the hot men in Rose jail, like even the Rose section doesn't have any guys that I'm interested in. Um, yeah, so like if that tells you anything, like even the Roses, the Rose section doesn't have anybody. But I will say it's not all bad. Like I am easily impressed. I know I sound like I'm like having all these crazy standards, but I'm honestly very easily impressed. Like it does not take that much to impress me. And it is, I prefer meeting people in person because you can get such a better first impression of them than like a stupid profile on Hinge or something. Like if I meet a guy in person, I'm like way more likely to think that he's attractive because like people, first of all, look better in person. Photos usually never do anyone justice. So usually they almost always look better in person and I'm not gonna judge people's looks that much nearly in person as it is on a st static photo in a profile. Um, so like, in person, way easier. 
Also, you can show off your personality. You can show off your charisma. You can show off your humor. You can do so many things in person to make someone be like, oh, am I kind of into this? You know what I mean? But on a profile, it is very difficult, I will say. But in person, like, not that hard to impress me. Really not that hard. And I talk about the dating life here in Spain all the time. It's honestly really hard for me to adjust to because at least in the US, and I know I could, like there's plenty to complain about in the US as well, but I, in general, not even just with dating culture, I really miss that in the US there's like a mingle culture. And I was just talking about this with Tali and her friend last night, that there's no mingle culture here. Like I remember I asked Tali when I like first moved here, it was like a week after I moved here and we first went out to like brunch together. Uh, I was like, so like, <laughs> tell me where's all the places that people go out to like drink and mingle and she's like oh what are you talking about like they don't they're they don't have anything like that here and I was like what <laughs> what do you mean they don't have that here how do people meet people like what do you mean and she's like no like people usually go out in their own groups and like you don't really go out to like meet new people it's kind of like you go out to just like go out with your friends and I was like, what? Like, not even like a rooftop party, not even like rooftop bars. Like, what do you mean? Because <laughs> I'm used to, for example, in the US, like men are much more open to come up and speak to you. It's not this weird, like, oh, we're only with our group. So like, we can only talk to our group. Like, in my experience going out in the US, people are much more open, much more chill, much more open to like meeting new friends at the bar. Like, girls are in the girls' bathroom. Like, hey girl, let's be friends. Like, yay, you look so good. Ah. And then you go, in the bar and like I don't know it's not that weird to like go up and meet new people it's not weird for guys to come up and ask you to get you a drink like it's just like a courtesy offering to like open up a conversation with you and it doesn't mean that you're automatically like assumed to go home with him you know so it's not I mean it can be there's obviously certain situations and times of the day or the night that like might be more suggestive than others but in general a man offering to buy you a drink in the U.S. does not equate him of like full-blown pursuing you the whole night it's like more of a gesture to say like hey i like you i'm offering this to you can we start a conversation like can we mingle our groups maybe you know like it's kind of like a peace offering and i think that's very nice of course you don't have to do it but it is kind of a nice gesture it's like a man going out and hunting something and bringing it to you and being like I hunted this for you, please be my wife. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's not that expensive of a gesture to just like show like, hey, I'm interested in you. No worries if not, no worries if not, but like, hey, can we maybe mingle? So I miss that dynamic in the US where people are are very open to like mingling amongst groups. Like even when I would go out with my friends, like sometimes we would split up and like I would be talking to some random people for like an hour in the corner over here and my other friends are talking to people for an hour over here. We eventually meet up, like everybody kind of meets each other. Like I miss that. And it was the same in Minnesota as it was in Arizona. Like people are generally very open to like mixing and mingling at the bar. That's what I'm used to. So then I move here and I'm like, oh, what do you mean people don't mingle? Like, what do you mean? Like, how do people meet people? Because especially as an adult, if I don't want to meet somebody on the apps, I don't necessarily want to be drunk at a bar meeting somebody either. But that's why I prefer like a daytime rooftop situation where you're not necessarily drinking like late at night, like trying to get super drunk. Like maybe you're just out for like a lunch or like a dinner and then you stay out for like an extra hour or two and you're only having a couple drinks, but it's just like a cute dinner drink situation. It's not like full blown bars, like club situation. I much prefer like a day drink, a rooftop, like an afternoon drink and like mingling. That's what I love and it just, it doesn't exist here. It doesn't exist. Um, so the closest thing I can think of is there's occasionally rooftop parties that are curated or hosted by like maybe um, a co-working organization or maybe there's like party groups that create like random rooftop parties once in a while, but it's not like a super common thing. And even at those rooftop parties that I've been to, although they're definitely my preferred like method of hanging out and partying with friends, the people there still are not like as open to like making friends, if that makes sense. I think it's just a cultural difference to be honest. So I can't force it on people obviously, but that also affects like the dating scene. 
And guys don't offer drinks here. It's very much like, I think because like the gesture of buying a girl a drink here for some reason, I don't really know why or how this became a thing, but for some reason it's seen as like him pursuing you to like be together that night. Like it's seen as like a pursuing thing rather than like just a gesture. So girls here are like, no, please don't buy me a drink. Like I'll get my own, I'll get my own because they don't want to feel the pressure of the guy like pursuing them. So on the one hand, I totally get why girls are like, no, 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 like I'll get my own, I'll get my own. <laughs> because the guys are like so pushy that if they buy you something, they're like, no, now, now we have to. Whoa, hey, what the frick, what the frick? I didn't agree to anything, bro, what the frick? So that's the culture here more so is like, not that I have personal experience from it, but I've witnessed it and also heard it from my friends is that it's just very much like the guys don't walk up to you. First of all, in the bars, they do not walk up for even just friendly conversation. Like they, I don't know if they're too scared or they don't have the social skills or like, I don't know what it is, but they don't even just like walk up to you to just like start a cute little flirty conversation like that doesn't happen. So I don't know, maybe it happens in clubs, like because the bars are from like, let's say 11 to three. And then the clubs are from like three to six on average. So the one time I went to a club, I went to Bling Bling, which was actually super fun. I found it very interesting that even though I was out on two set all night, I was at like Cuatro Latas, Ferros, like we went to a few different bars and still even that night, like it's just people just don't go up to other people. It's really, really weird. And I feel a bit awkward doing it just because like I'm kind of like very obviously like an outsider. So I don't want to like make other people feel uncomfortable either. Like it feels kind of awkward to like break into the local vibe. Um, but at Bling Bling, people were so nice. Like, I think I made more friends from like 3.30 to 4.30 in the morning than I would have ever made between 11 to like 2 or 3. So I'm like, does something happen after 3 where people are friendly? Like, I don't know if it's just the level of alcohol that's going up all night. And then all of a sudden by 4, you're like so drunk that you don't care. Is it just the environment? Like the club is like more chill than the bars? Like I, I really, I don't get it. So it still perplexes me to this day. I just don't think I really vibe with the dating culture here particularly. Like I already wasn't super vibing with it in the US, but at least I'll give the, them credit. Like at least people will, like make friends with each other. But here it's like honestly quite isolating when you go out, unless you go out in a very touristy spot. Because of course, people that are out for like vacation are like down to meet anyone. They're, it's just a different vibe that you're on. But if you like live there and you go out, you're typically getting together with your friends that maybe you haven't seen in a while. So I kind of understand they might just want to like catch up with their friends and they're not really interested in making new friends. I can also understand that, but it is just a bit weird to me that like people just aren't generally open to like meeting new people when they're out. So it is a bit weird because if you just go out with like you and your friend, you and a friend, for example, like you might be kind of bored because nobody will speak to you. <laughs> so it's better to go out in a bigger group because then you at least have more people to hang out with. But if it's just like you and one or two other people, it's honestly kind of awkward to go out in a smaller group sometimes. And then from what I've heard, like, I don't know, the guys here tend to be a lot more like um, mommy's little angel, <laughs> like live with mommy for much longer. They kind of want you to just be their new mommy. Like they don't really offer to take you out and pay for the first date. But I think that again ties into like the women are very like, oh no, I'll pay for my part. Not because they necessarily want to. I don't think the women necessarily love paying for their part, but they do it as like a defense mechanism because they don't want like any lines to be blurred about like me being, or about the girl being like super interested in and like taking it all the way there on like the first night or something like that. So that's why men are like, oh no, women are empowered, empowered. Like they pay their part here. So we don't pay for you. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't think that's like really why though. It's because like the guys are assuming that if they pay for something for you, they're like owed something. So that's why the women are like, no, 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 yo pago mi parte. Like I'll pay for mine. Like we can go half, half because then there's no like insinuation or anything or like blurred lines. Like it's very like cut and clear. So I find that a bit unfortunate, honestly, because I don't know, I'm, I'm of the belief that um, guys should still offer to pay because like we are still not equal. 
You know what I mean? So I think it's still a very like chivalrous and like a nice gesture to do. Even if the woman still like insists on paying half and half, I think it's very nice for the guy to at least offer, especially on the first date. I mean, after that, you guys can do whatever you want. But I think like the first date, like I said, it's kind of like them showing like, I'm interested in you. Like, here's what I'm like willing to do for you. I find it very, very offensive if the guy is like insisting on doing 50-50 on the first date. I'll do it. I mean, I don't mind. I'll pay. But it will definitely (laughs) give me a different first impression than if he paid. I'm not going to lie. Everybody has their own philosophy on that. I know each country has kind of a different culture and vibe to how they handle that. Um, Like, I think the more north you go in Europe, like, they get a lot more like 50 50 like no no no, i'll pay my part so i still don't really understand that fully because they call it feminism but i'm like is it though because like they're not really fully equal still especially not in like social and like government situations and like you know like we're still expected to do so much more even if it's not like monetarily like just to show up to the date we already have to do so much more than the guy does you know what i mean so it's still not like equal So I don't know. But anyways, I do feel in general that women have like left men in the dust, which like go girlies, I guess. But it's not like a good thing because we don't want men to be like lagging behind. Um, But like I just saw a, a TikTok yesterday about different articles that were explaining like, I mean, we know this. This is nothing new, like the trend of women going to college more often than men, um, having a job and also being the primary like child rearer at home. So in general, women are just taking on like in most fields more work than men are and like less men are going to college and like pursuing higher education um, and less men are actually employed, I think on average that than women or like at least it, the scales have changed a lot recently. So I'm like, but the scales haven't changed in in the house. You know what I mean? So like the scales are just showing like women are working more because like they have the option to now. Um, they own more homes because they have the option to now. Like literally think about when did women get access to even like have a credit card? Well, I'm talking about the US, I guess, because this is my experience. Literally, women couldn't even have a credit card in the US until 1974. That is crazy. Women couldn't even get access to loans until 1974. And women couldn't even buy houses until 1974. So like, if we're, let's just call 1974 the year of when like women had access to a lot more things. We're looking at 50 years, exactly. Like in the last 50 years, we've come so far, but think about it, 50 years ago, in the US, uh, we couldn't even have a credit card or buy a house or take out a loan. And so I think people forget that I think people genuinely forget that. Like women were, you had to ask your husband. And if you weren't married, like good luck. But you, like this is why my mom and I talk about it all the time, but like previous generations, like women didn't have a choice. If they were raised in a really crappy household with probably alcoholic parents, um, parents who abused them. So no wonder so many women left the house at 18 because like it was their first chance to get out under their terrible abusive household and like, get access to something else even if it wasn't that great but like at least if they found a husband they could like get out of their previous abusive household but it might still not be the best decision because then they're what probably um probably already mothers at 18 can't work have no work experience no real education outside of high school if they graduated high school and everything that they do is now owned and decided by this man that they picked at 18. like You know, so really when you put it into perspective like that, like, and this is just mostly white women as well, right? Like there's been so many barriers for other people who are not white, even up to today. So you really have to put it in perspective, like that we are not that far away from when people just like straight up couldn't even like make decisions for their own life, let alone like have (laughs) access to, I don't know, just like higher education and things like that. So To say today that women are like more highly educated, working more, basically the full like household managers of all their homes and being the primary breadwinner. I mean, it's great. It's absolutely great when you think about it for the past 50 years, but it's like men have just like not kept up. And obviously there's a lot of discourse online about how like, I mean, I think by the natural way of things, like literally if you think of like all of history, 
that we know, like all of like written history in the last, like, I don't know, let's just say it goes back to like zero. <laughs> what, wait, what is the year? <laughs> it goes back to zero. <laughs> like year one. Oh my God. I love that movie. What do they call it now? Zero AD? No, that's a video game. You guys know what I'm talking about. The year zero or the year one, like the movie. Um, but anyways, but if you literally go back, like, let's just say we go back to year zero, all of written history that we know since then is like just women being extremely oppressed. Um, so yeah, like the last 50 years in comparison to the last like 2000 years, right? Like that's pretty impressive. But also when you put that in perspective of like men have only ever known in like generational trauma, generational, like whatever that, I don't know, whatever happens over 2000 years of generations of men, like constantly being the oppressors, like for in 50 years for it to like flip flop. I mean, that is kind of crazy, amazing, but like for men, I can only think that like, it must be so confusing for them <laughs> because this is something completely new. And I'm sure a lot of them are probably pissed off because they were expecting a certain like status or whatever they want to call it. And then all of a sudden they're not going to get it after like thousands of years. And I'm not saying like each man, man individually is having these thoughts, but like as a collective society, like, yeah, like that's a lot of changes to be happening. And I don't think that men are typically the most like empathetic or like understanding individuals to be like, yeah, like, let's just switch. Like historically, that hasn't really been the vibe. You know what I mean? For them to be like, no, 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 you go first. Like you guys can take a turn. You guys take a turn. So like, these are all reasons why I haven't had a boyfriend yet. Because, hey, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. There's been chances, but I... First of all, I mean, it's also coupled in with like a million other things, right? It's never just like one or two things. But in my case, I grew up like very people pleaser, very like you need to listen to the man of the house, like do whatever the man does and like make the man happy. And like you basically get no wants or wishes of your own. Like I thought I had to marry somebody that did all the exact same things that I knew men were like supposed to do growing up. And I was like, hey, I guess the guy I marry has to like, I don't know, like sports and like hunt, I guess like. I guess that's the guy I'm supposed to look for because I didn't know, know anything outside of that. And it's kind of crazy. It took me until I was like literally 24 and living on my own in Arizona and like going to therapy for the first time that I was like, wait, like I can do stuff that's like different. I can like have opinions and like thoughts of my own. I'm not kidding, guys. Like you, some of you might be looking at me or like listening to me and thinking that's like crazy and stupid. I was 24 before I even like had thoughts of my own. I'm not joking. Like my brain had to basically fully cook and develop by 24, 25 before I was even like, oh, like I'm allowed to have other opinions. Like I'm allowed to like have wants and needs and like do stuff that's not considered like typical. Like that is allowed. And so then it's been like a whirlwind of the last like five years of me being like, oh my God, everything I grew up thinking was like not real. Like it's kind of crazy. And then since I was such a people pleaser and I like, first of all, didn't want to be rejected either. So I would never like put myself out there either to guys that I thought were attractive. And even guys that I did talk to in the past, I would never like talk, talk to them first or like text them first, like never. So I was very passive, like in the backseat and like whatever the guy I wanted to do was what happened. And so obviously they're not going to like outwardly commit to me if they probably have like seven other girls that they're also hooking up with. Like they're not going to be like, I found you and I only ever want to like be with you and I'm never going to hook up with another girl again. Like that just wasn't the vibe, especially in college and stuff. So I was never very like taking an active role in that because I wasn't taught to do that. So I have had situationships with guys. I've obviously gone on dates and things like that, but it's never been like really a great experience if I'm being completely honest. Some of them I'm still friends with. So, hey guys, like love ya, but you know, so yeah. But the other ones that I'm not still friends with um, have been honestly quite traumatic, like very traumatic. Um, and so that also prevents me from wanting to in engage in any sort of romantic side quest of my life. You know what I mean? Because my all my previous experiences pretty much are not like great. 
So I'm not like sitting there like, la la la, oh, I just miss talking to guys. They're so fun and so, ah, uh, yeah, it just brings me so much pleasure. Like it is, it's something in my mind that has been like cemented as like, ooh, not very fun. So obviously I'm not like, thankfully, I guess in the way that I've reacted to it, I do not seek out men's attention like on a daily basis. Like, of course it would be nice. And like, I do enjoy male male validation from time to time. Like I try to separate myself from that and not center male validation. But like, I just learned that I didn't have to do that five years ago. Like it's still going to take some time to like fully remove that from like my attention and my life. I'm very thankful that like during COVID I didn't date at all and I had that time to like grow my brain a bit and go to therapy for four years and not date during that time because I probably wouldn't have made the best choices. Um, And I just like, I basically just let guys like walk all over me before. And I can't imagine if I would have dated in that mindset that I had before. Ooh, terrible. It would have been bad no matter what. The guy still could have been nice enough. But I did not have a healthy mindset to be, I don't think it would have been responsible for me to be in a relationship if I'm being completely honest. I did not have boundaries. I didn't even know you were allowed to have those. I didn't know what they were. I didn't know what they were called. I didn't know there was a word boundaries. Like all of this I had to learn in therapy. Like I was not taught to any of this (laughs) growing up. I don't think anybody in my town or like people I knew growing up, nobody in my orbit in my bubble of life was like taught these things. Like this is something that literally was like a revelation with like TikTok coming out and going to therapy and like learning all this stuff. I was like, I feel like a whole new world opened up to me. I was like, whoa, like I can make these decisions. Like what? So I've had to do so much learning and also unlearning in the last five years to like even know what a healthy attachment is. And like know that I'm like allowed to have like opinions and like not be a passive like bystander in my own relationships. Like that's kind of a crazy realization to come through, to come to and to also like maintain. I I don't know. So it's still all very new to me. Right. And I haven't really put it into practice since learning all of this because I haven't found anybody that I want to try putting into, into practice with. Like really I haven't. And I was already pretty picky to be honest before I learned all of this, like even in my very like passive people pleaser days, like I was still super picky. Cause I just, I was like, no, like I don't need to like be with guys like that. Like I did not date in high school. I went on like, well, I had like one situation ship that we went on like a few dates and like that was it. And even my like high school or my senior year prom date, like I didn't even know his name until like the day that he asked me to prom. <laughs> like, hey, Sam, doubt you're listening to this, but like we were just pairing up because like our group, our like groups just wanted to like pair people up. So like it was really just for pictures and stuff, you know what I mean? But I like didn't even have a guy that I was like even remotely interested in for like my senior prom, you know what I mean? It was like, I went with like this random dude who was like a friend of a friend, you know? So I mean, like high school didn't really have that much experience or or much interest, to be honest. I was way too innocent. I would have been way out of my realm if I was like even dabbling in it. And um, in college, like, I wish I would have had so much more experience and knowledge of how to like handle myself in a healthy way in college. Like I feel like I was just, dropped into the deep end of a pool and was like flailing and didn't know how to swim. It was terrible. And so I don't think I've ever really had a good like experience with a guy where I was like in a healthy mindset. You know what I mean? So I haven't even ever put it into practice yet. Um, because I do like really, I am very hyper independent. Like I'll admit, you know, I have like my setbacks as well that I'm like definitely trying to keep myself safe. And where I feel safe is not a man like messing up my life. Like I would much rather just do my own thing because I can control myself and my surroundings and my job and my happiness if I don't have a man meddling in it. (laughs) So I'm only going to like open that door, just keep it like open it like just a little bit for a guy that I'm like very impressed with. And even then he's basically starting out in jail and has to work his way out. Like there's no way that I'm gonna meet a guy and just be like, yep, you're perfect. Like I'm running a full background check. I need to know that you've never had a DUI. You've never, I mean, in certain cases, obviously like you can, there's nuance to everything, but like, how do I know that you've never sexually assaulted someone? How do I know that you're a trustworthy person? How do I know that you've never like, 
I don't know, assaulted someone, period. Like, I just need to know that you are like a trustworthy person. So I've just seen way too many times where women are like, yeah, no, he seems great. And he and the guy turns out to be like a literal felon. I I'm obviously I'm I'm sound I'm saying it like it's quite strict, but for my own safety and my like sanity, I'm gonna need you to prove to me that like you're a trustworthy person. And it's not fair in some ways. Like I get it if it the roles were reversed. It's not fair. Like, it's not fair to have to prove yourself if you know in your heart of hearts that you are a good person. And I'm sure most people are. But, like, as women, we do have to protect ourselves. So I just hope that if men are listening, they can understand why women might be so standoffish or so, like, distant. Because there's obviously a good reason for that. You can only imagine if a woman is, like myself, like, very resistant to engaging with a man even in my daily interactions with men I'm like always side-eyeing them a little bit I'm still gonna engage in conversation and be very friendly and very nice but I'm still always like are you trustworthy or are you like not trustworthy like I'm always gauging if they're like somebody that I deem safe to like be around me because I just I really don't like I don't trust men I have a very severe trust issues with men I would say that's one of my biggest setbacks but like for the men listening, why would a woman feel like that? Like, we don't want to feel like that. You know what I mean? So I think you have to have a little bit of empathy as well as like, you're not going to always be the bad guy. You just kind of have to like show a little bit. I mean, I think women are saying like, there's a lot of bark and not as much bite. We have to though. Like, we have to. Like, if I don't, then I'm like opening myself up for like, honestly, straight up danger. So I hope you can understand why I might be a bit fearful, avoidant, (laughs) until I can trust you to like be in my space. So that is really what holds me back because I'm looking for somebody who's charismatic, funny, caring, has a healthy attachment like Adam Brody or like, well, like Noah in Nobody Wants This and who I think is attractive and who has a similar lifestyle as me. It doesn't have to be the same, but like, that we have similar plans in life that doesn't want kids, that is not super set on marriage or like spending holidays with families. Like I'm not super traditional in that way, so I don't care. And I don't think I wanna be with somebody who's super traditional about like, if they have like a really intense family that like always does everything together, I don't really care about that. So I don't really wanna, (laughs) I don't really wanna participate in that. So I'm like a bit more nomadic, more independent. Like I don't really need to be doing big family get togethers all the time. Like I kind of prefer just immediate family once in a while and like just friends that you make your family, you know what I mean? So I, it's hard. Like when you really write down your non-negotiables, especially like kids, like that's one that's really like, come on, you can't be dating somebody that wants kids if you don't want kids. Like it's just never, you're eventually gonna get to a point where you're at an impasse and it's never gonna work. So yeah, I mean like, I think it's honestly kind of a lot to consider when you're like, trying to find someone that you're compatible with. And I think I do look at it at a bit more of a a logical way rather than like a romantic and like, oh, I'm leading with my heart. Like I have been burned too many times, like leading with my heart, so to say. So cringy, but it's true. So I have to like look at it very like, like matter of fact, like what's going on here? Like, let's look at the facts. Like, let's not get our, you know, mind and feelings all mixed in. Like what's going on here? Like, let's like, as if we were both applying to a job and we had to like put it down on paper, like, are we compatible or not? Cause like, otherwise we're just wasting each other's time. And like, I'd rather not. So is it a bit cold? Is it a bit callous? Sure. But I would rather err on that side than like being a bit frivolous and like hurting myself in the process. So yeah, I guess I can tend to be a bit cold, a bit distant. Um, But like I said, I think in general, women tend to lead much more fulfilling lives in the sense of like closeness with friends and family. They feel very fulfilled like in the loving side of their life. Like it doesn't always have to be romantic love. It can be platonic love. Like you can love the people in your life without necessarily needing it always to be romantic. So in that way, I feel extremely fulfilled. I'm very happy with where my life has gotten me so far. And like, if a guy comes along that I think we would be a good team together, great. If not, like I'm not putting so much of my attention on it. Cause like, it's 
fine. And also I think Lexapro and Propranolol have helped a lot because <laughs> I'm not so tied up in my emotions being attached to the outcomes of things lately. So it's not so emotional when I think about like, oh, maybe I don't find someone before I'm 30. Cause for some reason it's like these milestones feel so big. And I say that as the title because it is kind of a big milestone, but like, I don't really care. I used to think like, oh my God, how embarrassing is it if I turn 25, I turn 26, I turn 27, if I've, I've never had a boyfriend. Then whenever I do date someone, I have to be like, oh, I'm 27 and I've never had a boyfriend. I don't care about that anymore. Like if anything, I'm just very thankful that I have been able to like fully grow my brain <laughs> before having an, a very long-term intimate relationship with someone. Like I feel very fortunate, if anything, that I have had the upbringing I've had and gotten the chance to go to therapy and gotten the chance to live on my own and like do all these things that women didn't even have literally the option to do 50 years ago. Like that is a crazy turn of events when you really think about it. So I'm like, you know what? My ancestors would want me to just really like savor the moment and don't ruin it by forcing it with somebody that you're not even totally sure about. So that's kind of like my point of this, this episode is like, yes, be open to love, be open to finding someone, but like, don't rush into it because you feel forced or you feel like you have to do certain things by a certain age or that there's pressure from friends and family who are telling you like, oh, like, why don't you have someone yet? Oh, oh, do you have a boyfriend? How's the dating scene? Blah, blah, blah. Like, don't feel outside pressure. Like, I think that's why I also really like the solo dates that Peyton talks about on her podcast. Cause like, it really allows you to just like check in with yourself and be like, am I happy with where I'm at? Do, how do I feel about meeting someone new soon? Like, am I in the right headspace to do that? What kind of partner would I want to be with? And like, hold it to that standard because I don't think that you should have or ever lower your standards. Like never, if anything, most women actually need to increase their standards. Most women, because I know women say, like I say, it's a lot of bark and not a lot of bite. We say like so many things, but it's so easy for women to waver on them. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing either. Like you should know when it's okay to like waver on certain things and like when are negotiables and non-negotiables. Cause if you never waver on anything and never make any compromises, yeah, you can also just be alone forever too, because nobody's perfect. But I don't think I'm saying that you need to find someone who's perfect. I'm just saying like, know what you want and don't like, waver on that just because you feel pressure from society, from your friends, from the guy himself who might be pressuring you just because he's maybe a bit more assertive than you are. Like, I think that is very important. And like the takeaway from this episode is like, don't feel pressure to do things by a certain age or to go out with someone just because like, oh, he could be a great guy. Like, just give him a chance. Give him a if you don't feel it, if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. So I think like that is what I want people to take away from this episode. And also I wanted to talk about Love is Blind US a little bit because it is genuinely fascinating that these people can get engaged in the pods without ever seeing each other and be so convinced that they are like in love and that they would be a great life partner to like immediately, as soon as they go to the honeymoon vacation or whatever, like the vacation, the first few days that they're together, it's like the cracks form so immediately. So I think it's just interesting that like the experiment and clearly love is not blind. I mean, clearly, but like people are also not truthful with themselves either. And I think that's a big part of it because like you don't realize how much you differ from someone until you're living with them. Like you're in each other's space all day. You see how they do things. Like they might give you the ick, which sounds superficial, but it's true. Like, I don't know, with Hannah and Nick, I still, I support Hannah for the most part, but when she got super upset at him for riding those duck things on the sand and like was like saying that she kept getting the ick and was like yelling at him over and over, I was like, he's, he's not even doing anything that's upsetting. Like he's just having some fun. Like, I don't know, like, why are you harping on him so hard? Like save your anger for something that's worth being angry at or like save your frustration for something that's worth being frustrated at. Like in my opinion, that was not a moment to be frustrated at Nick. Like he was just having like a little goof for like five minutes and it wasn't harmful. It wasn't disrespectful. Like he was just trying to like let, like be a little bit funny and she was like not having it. And I don't know. I just feel like it's very interesting to see the things that people switch up on like so fast as soon as they're like in the real world, so to say, and like with people in person. 
Um, and also everyone has a different definition of themselves, right? Like somebody like Alex, she's like, oh, I'm, I'm messy, but I'm not dirty. And then no offense, Alex girl. But like when we saw the apartment, when we saw Alex's apartment on the show, it was like, oh, see, like this might be her definition of messy. But I think to most of the world who is watching, they're like, oh, this is like dirty. Like, this is like, this is like kind of wild that you didn't have anybody come like clean it up like a little bit. Like, that's kind of wild that you left to go on Love is Blind and, like, left your apartment in that state. Like, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> also, Ramses, that he just, like, had the same conversation that we saw with Amber and Johnny, right? Almost the same. But that he's, like, this woke leftist dude and, like, so, you know, progressive and, like, gender roles don't conform or I'm not conforming to gender roles. Like, I don't mind being the same stay-at-home dad. And then they get to the birth control conversation, which like inevitably inevitably happens with at least one couple per season, right? But um, Marissa's like, oh, I don't want to go on birth control. And he's like, oh, but me don't want to wear condoms. They don't feel very good. And so he's just sitting there like letting her figure it out. Um, I know that's a tough conversation for a lot of couples like long term because like obviously it, it's not, no, no solution is ideal. But for him to just be like, me don't want to do it. Me, 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 me. Um, yeah, not so progressive and leftist and like non-gender role conforming when it comes to the tough conversations, right? Like the real, in, in real life, practical applications of these beliefs or whatever that he has. So it's like almost just like a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know what I mean? Where it's like, I would rather you just be straight up a douche, like from the beginning, rather than like toting around like you're this like cool way better than all the other dudes like progressive guy when like at the end of the day when like the buck stops like you're not um yeah just very I think if anything from love is blind I just find it extremely fascinating that they're like so in love with each other in the pods and then like immediately when they meet each other you're like oh like the cracks just form so quickly. So I think you just, even if you're like head over heels with the idea of someone and how they sound and like how their attitude and personality seem to be, like just in real life, like you just find out so quick if you're like actually really into someone or not. And most of the time they're not really that much into each other <laughs> or they lie, like people just lie. Like everybody thought Steven was actually gonna be kind of sweet and kind of cool. Like he was a bit goofy, a bit cringe. But then it turns out that he was like already cheating on her like a week into their relationship. Like, it's just, you can't even, you're in the pods saying like, oh, I've never met anyone better than you, blah, blah, blah. Oh my God, we're gonna be so perfect together. And then a week later, you're already cheating. Like, it's just crazy. It's honestly, it's wild. So it's like, you just see people like lying left and right. Like Tyler has children that he never told, Ma or that he never told Ashley about. So it's just wild, like you see them lie, that they lied about themselves, they lied about their circumstances, they lied about cheating, like just, there's always a lot of lies. And it, it is honestly, it's interesting to watch, but it's also like quite concerning as well. Anyway, so that was a bit of a longer episode as well, but I, I really, I feel like I could just keep talking about this forever. So you guys kind of got the point of what I was talking about, what, what, my, what my idea is behind all of this, but I think just really not feeling pressured is kind of my point because there's no rush to do anything. Um, enjoy if you're a woman, especially if you have like, you live on your own, you have a career, like be, I mean, no matter who you are, be proud of yourself. But especially as women, like when you really think about it, like only in the last like maybe 50 years, maybe have we really had even the option to like have independence with still a lot of you know obstacles in the way so be proud of yourself take it take time to go on a solo date be grateful be proud of yourself like don't feel rushed don't feel any external pressures like really just stay super super true to what you want and like don't let anyone try to tell you otherwise like just do what you need to do. And if a man fits into that, then great. But don't feel like you have to conform or overly compromise because you don't. And that's okay. And I don't think there's really any like pop culture and trend topics that I need to talk about particularly 
because a lot of it was basically nobody wants this and love is blind in the u.s season seven i think that's pretty much it i haven't seen much on tiktok lately um but honestly i feel like tiktok has changed a lot lately there hasn't been that many like trends or like really super funny stuff that i see all the time so i'm honestly getting a little bit bored of tiktok and i thought i would never say that i thought i would never say that but I used to spend way more time on TikTok and now I enjoy it. But yeah, I'm not like most of the videos I'm seeing are not like they're not hitting. They're not hitting. So, oh, I never thought I'd say that. But yeah, Instagram boring. I barely spend any time on there. So honestly, for me, YouTube is like where I spend majority of my time. I got a pizza delivery for a Tonka Jahari. I am Tonka Jahari, but I would never order a whole pizza for myself. I mean, I'll take it, but anyway. I hope you enjoyed. I think I've, I'm more than happy to make a follow-up episode on this, but I think I'll leave it here. This week, my goal for the upcoming week is to first go on a solo date and you know do some journaling, just really get in touch with what I want, maybe do a bit of a personal rebrand. I already have my yearly Canva calendar set up for 2025, so... Um, I'm just going to probably try and like revise that, maybe see what I want to do for the next like three months until the year is over, plan some trips, try to reach out to some brands for some like brand collaborations and yeah, get your shmoney up. That's honestly always what's on my mind because it seems like nowadays, I'm sure almost every single person can relate to this, but it seems like no matter how much money you make, it's still just never going to be enough because it feels like I take one step forward and then the expenses of things just push me two steps back. And it just feels like I'm always treading water. I can never get above water. Like it's always just barely enough. So get your money up stay single, don't feel pressured and watch Nobody Wants This because I need to talk about it with you guys in the comments. I need to discuss it uh, because if you haven't seen it yet, I need to know your impressions and I need to know how much you loved it. So anyway, um, thanks for listening <laughs> and uh, let me know if you have any questions about a follow-up episode for this because I think we could really flush this out into like a mini series or something. Uh, yeah, but anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Leave a review if you want. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want. And I will see you on the next episode. Have a good week. Bye.